Well, that song reminded me of a plaque that my wife found and gave to our son who just graduated from college last weekend. And the plaque simply says, uh, I'm not afraid of the next chapter because I know the author. And uh, if you look around our world right now, from a human perspective, the future is pretty scary looking. <laughs> um, wow. Who knows what's going to happen? But we know the one who knows, and we know the one who's in control, the one who was and is and is to come. And uh, he is our God. He is our Savior. He is our comfort. He's our joy. He's our hope. He's our confidence. And so it's just good to be reminded of that um, ancient of days concept from the book of Daniel uh, when we sing that song. Well, take your Bibles and turn back to the Old Testament to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. I taught through Ecclesiastes years ago on Wednesday night when we had a Wednesday night service, and I've never forgotten this book and just the profound wisdom that there's more to life than life. <laughs> there's more to life here under the sun, right? And that is obviously a relationship with God. And uh, we see this principle lived out all around us every day. In fact, I was reminded of it this week. I watched a documentary on Johnny Manziel, Johnny Football. You remember that guy, right? Texas A&M Phenom. And one of the, something he said in this documentary made me immediately think of Ecclesiastes. He, he said this, quote, Whenever I finally got everything I ever wanted, I was the emptiest I'd ever been. And I didn't know this, but he actually attempted to commit suicide. And the gun failed to work. And he's still alive today. We need to pray for that guy's soul, that he would come to know Jesus. That's what he needs. He needs Jesus, right? But it was really a fascinating um, story about his rise and fall, but... I want us to look this morning at Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 8 through 12, a passage that while it's tucked away here in the Old Testament, you probably have heard of it or parts of it, but let me read it for you. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, starting in verse 8, there was a certain man without a dependent, having neither a son nor a brother, yet there was no end to all his labor. Indeed, his eyes were not satisfied with riches, and he never asked, and for whom am I laboring and depriving myself of pleasure? This too is vanity, and it is a grievous task. Verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor, for if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. For woe, but woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm, but how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. Father, we're grateful, so grateful for this book that sits in front of all of us. We know that it's the only trustworthy standard of what we should believe and how we should live our lives. We thank you for giving us your spirit to help us understand your word and apply it to our lives. And so I pray your spirit would work amongst us again this morning. Uh, Lord, show us what we need to know. Uh, remind us of what we already know and may not be living it out. Lord, so that we can be more of who you want us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I have a secret fascination with mountain climbing. Not that I have any desire or would ever attempt to summit Mount Everest or scale the Dawn Wall in Yosemite National Park, but I do find the calculated insanity of those people who attempt these crazy climbs very intriguing. Like Kristen Harilla, the Norwegian climber who made history just last month, by becoming the fastest person to climb the world's 14 highest peaks in only three months and one day. Crazy. Or Alex Hunold, who rose to worldwide fame in 2017 when he became the first person to free solo El Capitan in Yosemite National Park, 
which was described by the New York Times as, quote, one of the great athletic feats of any kind ever. Some of you may have seen the account of that. It's a movie called Free Solo. I'm drawn to movies like that, documentaries about climbing. And on a flight I was on a couple of years ago, I watched a movie called The Alpinist that tells the story of Marc-Andre Leclerc, who was a quiet, unassuming, free-spirited Canadian who is considered the best climber of the century for completing some of the hardest, most daring solo ascents in the world, but managed somehow to fly under the radar in the climbing world. And interesting, the, the, the alpinist begins with an interview with none other than Alex Honnold, who is the most popular climber in the world today, and they ask him, who inspires you? And he responded, this guy, Mark andre Leclerc, who almost no one had ever heard of. And Honnold admitted feeling like a novice beside Leclerc because Honnold's climbing medium is rock, which is sturdy, it's stable, it's reliable, whereas Leclerc chose a mixture of ice, rock, and snow, which makes for a much less stable environment and requires switching gear mid-climb and using a combination of your bare hands and ice axes and crampons. And so uh, it's much more difficult, much more dangerous. Leclerc, Leclerc was reclusive by nature. He was uninterested in becoming a celebrity. He was not fond of cameras. He preferred climbing alone with no ropes and no margin for error. Even after agreeing to be filmed for the documentary, on one occasion, he actually set out on his own without telling the camera crews and completed one of the most extraordinary climbs all by himself. And when he got back to the camp, he casually explained that if anyone had come with him, it wouldn't, wouldn't have been a true solo climb. He wanted a, a pure solitary experience in the mountains, and that couldn't happen with a cameraman in tow. The makers of this documentary followed and filmed Leclerc for about two years, and sadly, he was buried alive by an avalanche in Alaska just as they were finishing editing the final movie. His body was never recovered. He was only 25 years old. Now, if Solomon were alive today, if he were writing wisdom literature today, I wonder if he would refer to Marc Andre Leclerc's example to make the point he was making in this passage, which is basically life is better with companionship. And those who foolishly try to go it alone in life often wind up a casualty. That's why it's always wiser to, to travel with a, a partner and stay roped together, if you will, uh, with, with someone else. And so if someone gets stranded on a ledge, the other can pull them to safety. Or if someone slips and falls, the other can catch them and keep them from falling to their death. I'm sure all of you have heard of the buddy system. Uh, the dictionary describes it like this, an arrangement whereby individuals are paired or teamed up and assume responsibility for one another's welfare. Buddy systems are used in the military. If any of you have served in the military, you, you understand the buddy system. Uh, some of you in your workplaces have applied the buddy system. A new uh, guy gets hired and they pair you up or you got paired up with someone else and, and uh, they were to kind of teach you the ropes, if you will, uh, show you the ropes, show you around, uh, get you acclimated to the culture of that corporation. And of course, all of us growing up in school uh, probably were first exposed to the buddy system whenever we went on a field trip. Remember that, right? They'd load you up on the bus and they'd say, okay, Everybody get your buddy. everybody got a buddy. And then uh, you're responsible for that buddy. And so you would go to the zoo or you would go to the fair or you would go to the, you know, aquarium or the park or wherever you went. And you had to pal around with your buddy. And then you got back on the bus. And what did the teacher say? Okay, has everybody got their buddy? 
I think that was a teacher's way of not having to work so hard keeping track of everybody, right? You just kind of take care of yourselves um, with this buddy system. Well, here in this passage, we see the biblical basis for the buddy system, along with the crucial benefits that it provides each one of us. And I think what Solomon said in this passage is so important because it goes against the trend in our society and even in the church, which is to live private lives in which we isolate ourselves from other people. I'll never forget reading uh, Kent Hughes's very helpful book called Disciplines of a Godly Man. And he, he made an interesting observation about modern suburban architecture. And he says, long, long gone are the days when every house was built with a large inviting porch, right, where you had easy access to the front door, which made it easy to get acquainted with others in your, in your community. Now we build these high privacy fences so we don't have to see or talk to our neighbors, right? We have, uh, you know, garage doors that open and close, uh, and we don't really have to get out and, and, and engage with anyone. Uh, we, we, rather than focusing on the kitchen and the dining room, we focus on our, on, on our entertainment rooms, you know, where we can sit alone and watch movies. And um, again, it, it's, it's, it's not unusual for us um, today to not even know the people living around us. And so Hughes said this way, and I'm just quoting him now. He says, the old adage that a man's house is his castle is coming true today. He says the castle's moat is his front lawn, the drawbridge his driveway, and the gate his automatic garage door through which he passes with electronic heraldry. He said we need to resist the lure of our architecture with its moats, drawbridges, and descending doors and overcome the technology of autonomy. He said most of all, we must overcome our privatized hearts for Christianity is a relationship with God and his people. And then he said this, don't miss this. He said, God's truth is most effectively learned and lived in relationship. God's truth is most effectively learned and lived in relationships. God designed us with the need for relationships. Genesis 2.18, God said it is not good for a man to be what? Alone. Now, granted, that verse was originally uh, referring to the creation of Eve to be a helpmate for Adam, but it also serves, I think, as a general principle about the nature of every human being. Whether we realize it or not, whether we want to admit it or not, we are by nature relational beings. And our growth and our development physically, emotionally, and spiritually is worked out Primarily through relationships. And it's through relationships that we develop into who God wants us to be. Consequently, those who don't take time to develop and cultivate close relationships with other people will never be all that God wants them to be. I'm convinced that's one of the reasons why so many Christians today are so shallow and so weak and so immature. They, they have not developed close intimate relationships with other believers who can strengthen them, who can support them, who can encourage them and counsel them and mentor them and pray for them and admonish them and hold them accountable to live their lives according to the principles of God's Word. Some professing Christians don't even feel the need to go to church at all. They're content to find a preacher on TV or listen to a sermon on the internet or radio in the privacy of their own home. What's far more concerning, I think, are those, however, that, that, that come to church every Sunday, but they never seek out meaningful, face-to-face, heart-to-heart relationships with other like-minded believers for the purpose of discipling one another. And I'm assuming you're familiar with that term disciple or discipleship or discipling. It's, don't overthink it. It's very simple. It's two Christians developing a friendship and helping one another become more like Jesus. That's all discipleship is. It's a spiritual friendship for the purpose of helping one another become more like Christ. Again, sadly, too many people are just drinking coffee and popping donut holes, but they're never experiencing true fellowship. All they get to talking about is the weather, or their kids, or their favorite uh, sports team, or their 
latest hobby or uh, the hunting trip they just got back from or their homeschool co-op, you fill in the blank, right? But they never get around to talking about the things of God, like, like what they're learning from God's Word, what they're, what they're praying about, uh, who they are trying to witness to and share the gospel with and what trials they're facing and what sins or temptations that they're struggling with. They're content to keep the conversation on the surface. They're careful to maintain a, a safe distance from others. They're, they're spiritual loners who try to elude any kind of accountability. If that describes you, you need to come to grips with the fact that you are living in a way that God never intended or expected you to have to live. God didn't design the Christian life to be a solo ascent. God never expected us to live the Christian life alone, but together with the help and the support of other Christians. Christianity is a team sport. It requires teamwork. And isolating ourselves from other believers has a deadening and dulling effect on our lives. On the other hand, regular interaction with other believers has a stimulating and, and sharpening effect in our lives. And every one of us needs that stimulation and that sharpening process to hone us into the likeness of Jesus Christ. We've all heard of Jonathan Edwards, but you may not have heard of one of he and Sarah's daughters, Esther Edwards Burr. And uh, she found Christian fellowship to be a sweet stimulus to her spiritual life. And in a letter to a friend describing a recent evening spent with other Christians, this is what she said. Oh, my dear, how charming it is to sit and hear such excellent persons converse on the experimentals of religion. You're like, Ken, you sound like you're quoting Pride and Prejudice or Sense and Sensibility. Yeah, that was the time frame, right, that they were living in. She went, and said, she went on to say this, I esteem religious conversation one of the best helps to keep up religion in the soul, accepting secret devotion. What a lamentable thing, she said, that tis so neglected by God's own children. In other words, what she was saying is one of the best ways for us to develop and maintain a close relationship with God is to develop and maintain close relationships with other believers. Spending personal time with God in his word and prayer is the most important thing we can do to grow spiritually, but second to that, a close second, would be spending time with other Christians. And it's sad that so many Christians neglect this vital part of the spiritual growth process, and in doing so, they endanger their spiritual lives. Our spiritual survival depends on consistent fellowship. Listen to what some of the great men of our generation have said about this. Jerry Bridges, in Growing Your Faith, he said, quote, spiritual fellowship is not a luxury, but a necessity vital to our spiritual growth and health. Donald Whitney, in his book, um, Spiritual Disciplines Within the Church, he said, you can't live the Christian life alone. Jesus didn't. There is no Christ-likeness in isolationism. J.I. Packer said this, the fellowship of sharing with one another what we've received from the Lord is a spiritual necessity for God has not made us self-sufficient. We are not made so we can keep going on our own. John Wesley said it very simply and succinctly. He said, quote, there is nothing more unchristian than a solitary Christian. And then Alistair McGrath, who's a British theologian, said this, the Christian is not meant to be nor called to be a radical and solitary romantic wandering in isolated loneliness through the world. Rather, the Christian is called to be a member of a community. And that community is this thing right here, the local church. Jesus Christ died not just to provide us forgiveness for our sin and eternal life in heaven, but also to provide us with a group of people with whom we can live life together here on this earth. Life for the Christian can be monotonous and grievous and treacherous. And having Christian friends makes life much easier, much 
more enjoyable. And I think that's the point of this passage. Notice the, really the context or the background um, that Solomon laid here in verse 8. He said, there was a certain man without a dependent, having neither a son nor a brother, yet there was no end to all his labor. Indeed, his eyes were not satisfied with riches, and he never asked, and for whom am I laboring and depriving myself of pleasure? This too is vanity, and it is a grievous task. If you know anything about wisdom literature, um, the book of Proverbs perhaps being the best example, Solomon, seem, it seems that Solomon would just kind of live life with his eyes wide open, and he would just write about what he saw. Like, right, the good comedians, right, the funniest comedians, right, they just, they just make jokes about life and the things that we all are aware of, right? And so Solomon just walked around, lived life, and he saw certain things that caught his attention, and he would muse on these things, and he would write some wise counsel to his son, right, in the book of Proverbs, uh, here to the world in the book of Ecclesiastes. And so, for example, he would see, you know, go by somebody's house that was falling apart and the, the grass, you know, was overgrown with weeds and, and, and he'd see this guy, it's like 9 o'clock and the guy's still in bed and, he, 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 and he'd be like, man, the sluggard, man. Well, let's, let's talk about the sluggard, the lazy guy. And then a little long, a little ways down the road, he, he comes across a little ant mound, right? And he'd look down and he'd see the ants doing their thing. And he's like, look at these guys go, man. They don't have a boss. Nobody's telling them what to do. They don't have alarm clocks, but they're up at, they're after it, up and at them, and they're working hard. And he says, hey, sluggard, you lazy guy, consider the ant, right? Um, and so here, apparently, he, he notices a guy. He observed a guy. Um, a lonely guy, living in isolation, a guy who was wifeless, childless, familyless, um, friendless. He was a miser who chose to go it alone in life. He didn't value relationships. Apparently, he didn't think he needed any friends, that, that he could get along fine without them. And this guy, I think, that Solomon described here describes too many Christians today who are flying under the radar and paying the consequences of privacy and isolation. And so Solomon goes on in verse 9, and he contrasted this lonely life of seclusion with a life lived among friends. And he compares going through what, what life is like going, uh, or what, what it's like going through life alone and, and what it's like traveling together with others. And so what I want us to see here in verses 9 through 12 are four benefits or advantages of relationships or friendship. Um, or you could say it this way, the, the buddy system makes us four things. It makes us better. It makes us safer. It makes us warmer and it makes us stronger. So let's look at these four benefits of a biblical buddy system, okay? Number one, uh, it makes us better. It makes us better. We enjoy greater growth and productivity. Look at verse nine. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. And I think we have here the power of cooperation. You can do more in less time together, right? Many hands make light work, we say. Um, and so this is the, the power of cooperation. And uh, we see these principles, by the way, uh, all over the New Testament in describing the church, uh, the, the idea of cooperation. For example, in Acts chapter 2, um, verse 42, this was after uh, 3,000 people got saved on the day of Pentecost and the church was born and it says in verse 42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place for the apostles and all, who, all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all all 
the people. So the idea there is just the, the, the commonality and the communion uh, that they shared together. They were cooperating with one another um, at, the, at the outset of the, of the church. And then Paul reminded the, the church in Philippi um, in chapter 1, verse 27, he said, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So our work that God has called us to as a church, as believers, as the body of Christ, is the work of the gospel, to get the word out, to get the good news of salvation out to this community and out to the world. And so we can accomplish that much quicker and more effectively and be more productive in that if we do that together. And then in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul was using the analogy of the human body and how all the body parts cooperate with one another and work together so that the body grows and thrives. He says... um, There in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, that he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors, teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful skimming, but speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. If you wanted to put a subtitle on that little section, you could call it bodybuilding. And talking about the, the bo- building of the body of Christ. And so when I think of this Uh, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. That's the picture that comes to my mind is is working out, right? You can work out alone and you can get a lot accomplished working out alone, going out and running on your own, going to the gym, lifting on your own. But there's something about running with someone else that they they push you, right? Um, they, They help you pace yourself, but they also push you um, or, or going to the weight room with a, another guy uh, or another gal, they, 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 they can spot you and they can encourage you and they can, they can spur you on and you can maybe lift more weight, heavier weight than you normally would. For example, the other day I was at F45 and uh, it was a partner workout today, which I don't necessarily prefer, but you had to get paired up with somebody else in the gym. And so they paired me up with this guy I'd never met before, so uh, we introduced ourselves and then it was time to go. And our first exercise was to be on the the bike, and we had to take turns trying to get so many meters in a certain amount of time, and we're competing against all these other people. And so this guy jumps on this bike, and he takes off like we entered a race I didn't know about. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this guy's not going to like me being his partner because I don't think I can hang with this guy. And uh, I just was watching him. He was just like spazzing out on this thing, and I'm just thinking, oh man, what is he going to So I... He jumps off the bike, and it's my turn. He's like, yeah, I just had my energy drink, my protein drink. And I'm like, dude, I just got out of bed. And uh, I jump on this bike, but guess what? I wasn't about to be outdone by this guy, so I just pedaled as fast as I could go, and I was doing as much as he was doing. And uh, at the end of the day, we won. And uh, I wouldn't have won if it was just me. (laughs) Trust me. But that guy pushed me, and he got more out of me uh, than I would have gotten out on my own. So I was better that day. Um, because there was two of us rather than just me. It's the same principle for spiritual growth. We grow faster, we grow deeper when we do it with someone else. So life is better because of the buddy system. Life is also safer. It's safer. We enjoy greater health and safety. Look at verse 10. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion, but woe to the one who falls when there's not another to lift him up. So here we have the power of restoration, that we're able to rescue each other when we fall. And we know this is uh, a theme throughout the the New Testament, Uh, our biblical responsibility to uh, care for one another's souls 
and to restore one another. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, in other words, if they're trapped in some kind of sin, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens. And so that's the general principle that we're to um, be ready and willing to restore Uh, one another. It's one of the one another's of Scripture. Um, If one of us falls into sin or walks away from the Lord, we need to go after them. We need to go on a rescue mission. And um, Matthew uh, 18 gives us the specific steps we're to follow. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you've won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. Notice the two or three, right? The more the merrier, right? That, that, that we live uh, in community. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. The whole church needs to get involved in this rescue mission. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. James chapter 5, verse 19 says this, My brethren, if anyone among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the area of his error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Again, we've already been talking about this analogy of mountain climbing and the little bit of climbing I have done Uh, Back in my teenage years, um, I learned a lot about belaying, right? You all have a carabiner, and you hook up. You make sure you're hooked up to the the other guy, either the guy at the top or the guy at the bottom. And uh, you you can't start climbing until you're belayed on. In other words, you're safe. Because if you fall, somebody's going to be there to catch you. Um, But the guy that wants to go solo, he's on his own. And if he loses his grip or he slips, he's a goner because there's nobody there. He's not blade onto anybody or anything. And so the idea is, right, you've seen this, I'm sure, on, you know, TV or in movies where somebody's climbing and there's two or three guys climbing the same rock face and one of them slips and falls and what happens? All the other ones brace and they absorb his fall. And he's able to get back to climbing again. And and his life is saved. His life is spared. Why? Because he was connected with other climbers. And so here's the idea. Um, If either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there's not another to lift him up. So relationships make life better. They make life safer. They also make life warmer. They make life warmer. We enjoy greater warmth and energy. Look at verse 11. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm, but how can one be warm alone? I think we have here the power of stimulation, Um, how we can inspire and encourage one another. We're all familiar with uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I think to fully understand why it's so important for us to not forsake assembling together um, and and be encouraged on a regular basis, you have to go back to Hebrews chapter 3 where the writer says this in chapter 3, verse 12. He says, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God, but encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, here it is, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And you know this to be true. The moment you walk out these doors and you're off on your own again, if you will, for the week, um, that hardening effect begins immediately. We begin being deceived, right, by sin. And it has this hardening effect slowly but surely over the course of a week. And that's why it's so good that the Lord in his wisdom gave us 
his day, the Lord's day, to come back and to knock off the rust, if you will, to soften up the heart again. Well, how much better to have times between Sundays, right, where we can engage with other believers and, and spend time with them and interact with them. And it has a softening uh, effect on our hearts. It also has a sharpening uh, effect. Uh, it, instead of getting dull, it, it, it makes us sharp spiritually. Um, Proverbs 27, 17, the, the theme verse for our Ironman program. Um, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And the idea there is, you know, if you want to maybe sharpen your knives in the kitchen, right? You get the, the metal on the metal, and uh, that has a sharpening effect on the knives, or, or sharpening a sword, right? Uh, that, that, that the idea is you, you, you run it over some, some, some metal, uh, metal on metal, iron on iron, steel on steel. And, and, and that regular interaction with other Christians produces spiritual friction. And that friction creates heat and sparks begin to fly. And it, it ignites a fire in your heart and it keeps the fire stoked. Um, it, it keeps our heart from getting cold and, and hard. We, we stay passionate and, and, and soft and, and hard, or excuse me, and hot for the Lord. When Kelly and I were up in Washington a couple weeks ago, we were uh, kind of camping out, if you will, in this cabin by this river, and we had a little campfire, and, uh, you know, nothing like a little campfire by a river in cool weather, right? Don't get me started. Um, when you feel like you're on fire here, literally, right? Um, but uh, anyway, so when you're done with that fire, how do you put that fire out? What's the, what's the quickest, easiest way to get that fire out? You say, well, you just bring a bucket of water, yeah, but if you don't have a bucket of water, what do you do? You spread out the coals. You, you, you get them away from one another, and what happens? They begin to die out, and the fire goes out. Well, that's what happens when we get away from one another, right? We begin to die out spiritually. Now, the exact opposite is true. You want to start that fire up again. You want to reignite that thing. What do you do? You push those coals back together again. You get them up, cozy up to one another, and you blow on it, and whoosh, it reignites. And, and so that's why you need to stay close and tight with other believers. So, the biblical buddy system makes us better, safer, warmer, but it also makes us stronger. It makes us stronger. Notice verse 12, and if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him, and a cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. So, here we have the, the power of combination joining forces and, and fighting together. And we know that Paul likened the Christian life to, to war. Um, Ephesians uh, chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Verse 11, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So we are at war. And notice how Paul called for reinforcements. Um, he was perhaps the most, um, the greatest spiritual warrior apart from Christ who ever lived and walked on the face of this earth. And if there was anyone who could have kind of handled himself on his own, it would have been the Apostle Paul. But notice what he does in verse 18. He says, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains and then in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So what was Paul doing here? He was calling in prayer support. He, he, he wanted reinforcements. He knew he needed the support of other believers. And again, the idea here is, again, fighting a war. There, there's strength in numbers. And the last thing you want to have happen if you're a soldier on a battlefield is to get isolated from your fellow soldiers. And so you want to you stand your ground together with a group of guys, with a platoon of guys, with a unit of guys, right? And, and back to back, shoulder to shoulder, side by side. And, 
And then just notice here how Solomon started with the number one. Then he moved to the number two, and then he closes with three. Like one's bad, two's good, three's even better. He says a cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. If you know anything about climbing rope, right, it's, it's, it's all about how they weave the different threads together. And, and a lot of it has to do with the strength, how strong a rope is, is a, how those ropes are intertwined together. And I think the emphasis here is the necessity of our lives being intertwined with the lives of one another. In other words, we're not out here kind of a, a single strand just kind of blown in the breeze. But we're, we're connected, we're, we're intertwined with, with one another. So, four benefits of the biblical buddy system. Simple, basic principle here, which lends itself to a simple question. Do you have a biblical buddy? If you don't, then get one. Since your spiritual growth and survival depends on it. Somebody said it this way, if you want to experience lasting change, true lasting change, you must understand and access the power of biblical friendship. We need to, to tap into the incredible resource that God has given us in our brothers and sisters in Christ. We desperately need one another. I cannot be all that God wants me to be without you. You cannot be all that God wants you to be without me. We can't be who God wants us to be without each other. And that's why God designed this thing called the local church. And so the question is, do you have the kind of friends, the kind of relationships who can help you grow and change? And are you being the kind of friend who can help others grow and change? I can't think of a better application of this text and this principle, this biblical buddy system, than grow groups. And if you're wondering what all these tables are doing out here with these little clipboards, those of you that have come to Lakeside for a length of time, you know what this is. This is, this is rush week, right? This is, this is when we try to get you to sign up uh, for a grow group. We're going to do it this Sunday, and we're going to do it next Sunday. And so, um, again... We tell people here at Lakeside, there's really only two things we want you to do. We want you to come to church on Sunday. We want you to be a part of this corporate worship gathering. But secondly, we want you to get plugged into a grow group. Um, nothing more important beyond Sunday morning than grow group. Grow groups are more important than women's ministry. Shelly gave me permission to say that, by the way. Um, it, it's, it, it's more important, grow groups are more important than men's ministry. It's more important than any other ministry in the life of our church. We want you to come to church and we want you to come to a grow group, get plugged into a grow group. And so I know some of you, most of you are already plugged in. Good for you. I think overall we're, we're, we're encouraged that we have a, a good percentage of our people plugged into grow groups. But uh, we're always, uh, you know, wanting more. Uh, we want more of you to get plugged in for your sake. Um, we're not keeping tabs. We're not you know, you know, trying to beat the statistics or anything like that, pat ourselves on the back that we have so many people in grow groups. That's not the point. We care about you, and we don't want you to slip through the cracks here at Lakeside Bible Church. If all you do is come here on Sunday morning, technically you're kind of flying under the radar. And um, we all know how to do it. We've all done it, right? But if you get into a grow group, then you take that whole solo ascent thing out of the equation. Now you're on belay. Some of you guys right now are climbing with no protection. You're, you're living your Christian life with no protection. Um, we want you to get you, get you on belay. We want to get you connected with other believers. And so this is an opportunity to do that. So what I'm going to do right now real quick as we dismiss is I'm going to call up the grow group leaders um, because we have some new grow group leaders and we have some new grow groups. 
And as our church has gotten bigger over the last year or so, we feel the need to expand our grow groups. So we're adding some new grow groups. Some of you who are already in a grow group are like, finally, I can get out of this old grow group. I don't like these people anyway. Uh, you could like, I got new options, right? No, uh, we're just trying to make it uh, possible for you to get to a group where it's not too huge. That's why we're, we don't want groups to be huge. Um, and uh, we also um, want to make sure there's one that's geographically convenient for you. So we kind of have them all over the place that hopefully there's one by your house or, or maybe there's um, other things that we connect you, whether you already know some people in the group or maybe you are interested in the topic, the subject matter, or there's other features like, oh, they have babysitting. That would be helpful. Or, man, they say they have dessert. I'm into dessert, so I'm going to go to that one. Whatever it is that draws you to the groups, um, we'll leave that between you and the Lord. But let me call up our leaders, tell you a little bit about their groups so that you can prayerfully consider what group to join. Uh, Chris Steyer uh, meets Wednesday nights at 6.30 every week. Uh, they do sermon application. So Shelly's going to represent him because Chris is over there teaching. Sam Hanahosa and Jimmy Rebellino, uh, they uh, meet the first three Wednesdays, or excuse me, first three Thursdays, of, uh, of every month, uh, 6 p.m. in Rivershire, uh, in the Conroe area. They do sermon application. They have babysitting. They do dinner. Wow, that sounds like a fun group. Um, so Sam and Jimmy there. Tyler Jacobs, Rusty Cook, that's sermon application. They do Sundays after church, the first and third Sunday. They do have lunch together. So it's right here on the campus, so that's an easy one to come to for some of you. Fred Brinkman, Bill Stevens, uh, they meet here at the church on Sunday nights, 5 p.m., twice a month. They have dinner together, and they're going through the book of Revelation. So if that intrigues you, that would be a good group to jump in. My group, uh, we meet on Wednesday nights, 6.30 uh, at our house. And again, we design it so you could drop your kids off here and then just come down the road real quick down um, to uh, Delago. And uh, we uh, meet every Wednesday, do sermon application, and we have really good dessert, okay, just so you know. Um, Tom Walters, Mike Stanberry, they meet on Tuesdays over in Magnolia. Uh, they meet at 6.30 every week. Uh, they have dessert together, and then they are going to be studying 2 Thessalonians. Uh, Nick Sarandis' group uh, meets on Sundays twice a month at 5 o'clock. They do dinner together, uh, and this is over on, in, uh, on FM 1097, right across from Bentwater. Uh, they do sermon application, so that's a good op uh, option there for those of you that live that way. Mike Goins' group meets here at the church uh, the second and fourth Sunday. Uh, they have lunch together. They do sermon application. Um, Chris Delagula and Eric Presley, they meet on Friday night, 6 p.m., twice a month. They do dessert and coffee. I guess they, it's a group date night, sounds like to me. Um, uh, they, they do sermon app, um, so that's Friday nights, Chris and Eric. And then we have a new group, uh, Marco Morales and David Taylor, uh, and this is going to be here at the church Wednesday night, 6.30 every week, sermon application. This is going to be hopefully the release valve for Chris's group that's gotten way too big. And uh, we'll be able to divide up some of those folks that are here. And it's just convenient because your kids are here. We get it. Um, and then we've got another one, a new group. Jesse Flewellen is going to start leading a group on Sunday nights, twice a month, 5 o'clock, sermon application over in the Willis North Conroe area. So if you're coming from New Waverly or Willis, we got a lot more people coming from that direction. That would be a, one for you to consider. And then we've got a new young married uh, uh, grow group uh, led by Tim Kemright and Greg West. Uh, they're going to be meeting on Sunday nights every week here at the church, 6 o'clock. They're going to provide babysitting. They're going through a book called Letters to a Romantic. Um, and this is, ready for this, you have to have, have been married five years or less, okay? So this is truly targeting our young married couples. There's more and more, God's providing more and more of those people here at the church who want to minister to them well. So that's who that group is designed for. And then, of course, you got the Crossroads group, uh, Kyle Jennison, Aaron Bloss, Adam Pabarez, and they uh, meet here every Sunday night, 6 o'clock, sometimes at the Jennison's house. They do sermon application, and they, have a, they probably have the most fun of, of any group, right? So anyway, if you're basically a college age, uh, young, professional, career person, that would be uh, a, a good grow group to, to consider, okay? So we're going to do this this morning. If it's, the lines get too long here when we dismiss you guys and you go, come immediately here to sign up, 
Uh, you can sign up next Sunday, but again, please make sure um, that you don't do the, the, the solo thing, okay? That's what we want to help you avoid. So we love you, so let me pray, and then we'll dismiss you guys. Father, thank you uh, just for this reminder this morning of how we need one another, and that you were so gracious and wise to, to provide us a body, the body of Christ, that we didn't have to go, al- go this thing alone, uh, and figure it out ourselves, um, but Lord, we, we get to live life together and, and, and pull and push and, 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 and encourage and challenge one another uh, along uh, in this process of sanctification, and so would you give every one of us wisdom uh, and direction and guide us to the group that would be most beneficial to our souls and most, most beneficial to our growth in Christ, and uh, Lord, we pray for a great launch of our grow groups this fall and that people would get Uh, connected, uh, they would get cared for, uh, they would receive good counsel, and uh, Lord, that uh, we would ultimately all change and be more conformed to the image of Christ.